Morning, church. Welcome. Welcome to Trinity. Uh, if you'd like um, to take a seat, you'd be welcome to do that. There's loads of room here on my right. Um, all these seats on the right, on my right, have been specially blessed before the service. So if you are looking for a blessing, that's the place to go. We're going to begin just a second uh, in worship. Uh, sung worship together. Just as we do, Tanya is going to come and share a story uh, just to build uh, faith, a sense of expectation for what God wants to do today. Tanya, you've been in Asda again. Uh, <laughs> I've been in good old Asda. All happens in Asda. Yeah, I was just sharing a story in our prayer meeting before. And I don't know if you remember, but a while ago I had this moment where you can only describe it as like a little angelic encounter. Well, I was in Good Old Asda's and this same guy was there again. So then I was thinking in my head, logically, oh, maybe he's just a normal person then. Maybe he's not an angel. So basically, he's at the checkout and there's a couple there and I'm a little bit further away. So I said, God, if that really is, that really was an angel and it was a bit of an angelic experience, get him to say something to me that he'd know about me. And literally, as I said that, he said to this old couple, he said, um, you see that girl over there? She was a singer. And I looked and he went, were you a singer? No, the couple said, were you a singer? I was like, yeah, I was. And he said, the real question is, 
will you sing here in front of everybody? And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I can't, what do I do? Because I've just said to God to get him to do it and all of this, and I'm like, oh no. And then what was amazing is the little couple, the woman turned around to me and she said, if you sing, I'll back you. And I was like, oh my, and Neil comes along and there's his wife at the end of a checkout going, singing. Because I was like, I'm going to have to do it, God. It was really embarrassing. So I started to sing at the checkout to this guy and to this couple and the little old lady joining in. But um, in the prayer meeting, I was reminded of this. And it was just simply that sometimes you have to go through our uncomfortability. Uh, that's not a word, is it? <laughs> it works. <laughs> or Does, discomfort. I said the word that he really doesn't like. I've never done it our uncomfortability, and um, we have to step through that. And what's amazing is, it's just like that woman's line was that, if you go, I'll follow, and I'll join with you. And just even this morning, it's like having that faith and actually eyes open to encounter whatever God's got for us, um, and stepping into that, and then stepping again forward, and actually going for it and singing in front of a whole supermarket. Um, but it was just, it's built my faith and I, I hope it builds faith this morning that God has got stuff for us to carry and for people to follow us in as we do that. Yeah, let's stand. Tanya, stay here. Why don't we stand together? We're going we're gonna to step in, in in just that way. And it, there's probably not a lot we could do that's more foolish than singing in a packed supermarket in front of everybody. And there's something about the foolishness of that and the step of faith. And I just um, feel that's for us. You know, we spend so much of our time, at least I do, trying to sort of put across an image that's uh, polished or um, makes sense to myself or to the world. And then God is just calling me into, is calling us into uh, foolish obedience sometimes, and I don't know what that looks like for you this morning. It certainly will look like singing uh, in just a moment. But I wonder if we could just come before God. Tanny's going to pray in just a second for us, and even ask Him now, Lord, what is the foolishness of faith for me today? Remember the words of Jesus. He says, Father, I thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and you've revealed them to little children such as, such as these, for this was your gracious will. Father, thank you that you've hidden your secrets in foolish places, and you reveal your glory so often in the simplest things. You're so clever, God, but you're not impressed with intellect. But we do bring all that we have before you now. All of our minds, our bodies, our spirits, Father, we want to encounter you. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, I thank you that you care so much about us as individuals, that you show up in as the any supermarket I'm sure but I thank you Lord that you show up and when we ask you you do answer and you reveal yourself and you reveal your power and you you reveal how much you know us each one of us and I just pray Lord that in our normal weeks that we would continue to encounter you in those incredible ways that raises our faith and we pray Holy Spirit that you would just I know you're here already, but I pray that we would, um, we would welcome you and that we would invite you to transform us this morning, to um, re-energize us this morning, 
to worship God, to start the song so that others will follow. Lord Jesus, I, re- you know, I love you and I do feel like I, I can trust you. And I pray, God, that this morning, if that's just for, for us here, that we, we'd be able to trust you and know that you are there. And we pray you come with your fire this morning, which is gentle and loving. And we pray for an encounter, a fresh encounter of you this morning. And come whatever way you, you will, whatever way you want. We just pray for you to move in this room. Come Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus, so much. We thank you for all you're doing in our lives. Thank you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Come. Yeah, in just a second, we'll strike up the band and all that good stuff. There's a, there's a set, I'm sure, of worship. But before there's a set, I just wonder if there's a, a song from God's people. Tanya's, Tanya's been leading worship in, in Asda this week. I just wonder if we could just raise a, a song of praise uh, together. Let's just release a sound of worship. The band will... will um, sure just begin to sing out their praise but let's just with our with our own voices this morning just raise up a song thank you Jesus just sing his name if you don't know what else to sing we praise you Lord worship you Jesus all honor and glory are yours praise you Lord praise you Lord Jesus 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 Jesus, 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 oh, worthy are you, oh, worthy, worthy, worthy. Hear the cry and the prayer and the song of your people, Lord. Fill this house with worship, fill this house with praise, fill this house with your own name, Lord. Emmanuel, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. If you're for us, who can be against us? God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. Sing that. God is with us, 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 God is with us. One more time. God is with us, God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. God is for us. God is for us. God is for us. God is for us. God is for
Show us who 
us how to live. Spirit, show us who we are. Spirit, show us who He is. Spirit, show the Father's heart. How wide, how long, how wide, how deep is this love? Is your love? Reach to the heights, sing to the depths, see the fullness of His love. We come in prayer. Seek your face to see your face to grow in your love. Your power, your power and faith. Our hearts, our hearts are an open door for Christ to enter. riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith 
And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. To know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amy's just going to lead us in a time of encounter, just a second, and um, just thought before we do that, I'd read some verses from Hebrews. I've been reading Hebrews again recently, and these words uh, stuck out to me in the last week. Hebrews 12, verse 12, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And I think it stuck out to me because I've been feeling uh, a little feeble and quite weak of late. And there is a, a, an imperative, a command here to strengthen that which is feeble and that which is weak. And um, it certainly seems as if we're to partner and participate in that. That's not just God's job, it's our job also. There is a... Uh, a joining together with him in this. In the next chapter, uh, Hebrews 13 says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. <laughs> it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. And so, just in this moment, as Amy leads us, I encourage you strengthen 
the places in you which are weak, but strengthen them with grace. And we're going to do that as we encounter Jesus. Yeah, just really simply, um, all I felt like was the Lord was saying just to open our hearts up to Him this morning. And so, you know, wherever you are, whatever you've come in, how you've come in this morning, whether you're full of faith, lacking in faith, heavy, on fire, whatever it is, there is an opportunity, an invitation, I really believe, to open our hearts up to Him this morning. And so maybe where you are, you might just want to close your eyes, just a way of um, taking away distraction. And you know, this is always invitation, always invitation. The question is, will you open your heart to me, He says. And so maybe how you might do that, just say simply, Lord, I open my heart to you. I need a fresh encounter of your presence. And so Holy Spirit, you know the hunger in this room. You know the disappointment in this room. And we just ask, Lord, you are above it all. You're bigger than those feelings. You're bigger than that. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you move? Would you breathe life onto your people this morning? Come, Holy Spirit. For those desperate for encounter right now, we ask, come, Lord, fill them up. Fill them with your presence. Whisper in their ears. Testify with their spirits that they are children of God. So we're just going to wait. Push away those whispers. Don't disregard them. Speak, Lord. So just waiting on God. I saw a picture in my mind of a something we used to have in our in our bath growing up. 
was, uh, some kind of sort of loafer. It, anyway, it was really, uh, it was kind of abrasive. I think that was probably its job, but I never really knew what it was there for. Uh, but when when it when water got into it and it would absorb the water, and it would soften, and um, I suppose it became friendly and um, usable. And I, I just feel today that what God is doing as we soak in Him is softening us. And we don't necessarily know anything's going on, do we? But something's happening in us as, we f- as we're filled with the water of life, His living water, His Holy Spirit. And we receive His Holy Spirit by faith. So just to encourage for some, actually, what He's wanting to do is a softening. And I do feel He wants to release a weeping in the church again. And I was thinking this morning of uh, Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem, even as we countenance that today. He weeps over the city. And I think that's one of the things he wants to release through the church. And it it actually happens in these times of softening that we receive his heart. So just go on doing that even now. But I I also had a word. uh, I don't know if this is for somebody today, but I sense there was somebody in the room and you've come today and specifically today you've asked, Lord, I just need one friend. And you've come with that particular prayer or desire in your heart. And I, the phrase in my mind was, I think, from Psalm, the Psalms, perhaps Psalm 25, but could be wrong. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him. And I felt for this person that there is a specific thing that God wants you to honor Him with. And, and, um, and as you do that, you will receive a new measure of His friendship, which is part of the answer to the prayer that's in your heart today. So Lord, if that's for anyone here, I pray that you would speak to them clearly today. I just sense there's some people here today who are trying very hard to hear God, to see God in their lives, but there's just something that's blocking you and, and you don't know what it is. So I'd just like to encourage you to just to come up for prayer, for restoration. you want to respond to that now, do feel free to come to the front or to raise your hand where you are. We're just going to pray into that and pray for folks, even now. So if that's you, just raise your hand if that's you. We'd love to pray with you. Okay, see some hands raised. If you're close to somebody with a hand raised, would you just extend a hand toward them? Father, we speak restoration now. We speak a restoration of hope. We speak a restoration of confidence, of intimacy. I will restore. has eaten and I pray even in this moment for those who feel they've wasted not just days or weeks or months but years decades even Father restore unto them the joy of your salvation may these bones that you've crushed rejoice Weeping may remain with the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let joy come now. We speak a a season of singing.
time of joy from this moment on. just going to continue to pray for those folks but let's just step into intercession I'll keep this brief because we've uh, time is running on but I'm just going back to that Hebrews thing he uh, therefore strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees make level paths for your feet Lord Jesus as we consider your church in this city Trinity Church and the church gathered here in this place, the people of God, but also across this city. We pray for a a strengthening now. Where we have become feeble and weak, in our arms and our knees, strengthen us. Make level paths for our feet, God. Teach us to walk again. Teach us to follow you again. And just in your heart, you don't need to do this uh, physically, but in your heart, just pray for the person sitting next to you, either side. Pray strength for them. Even now, just in your heart, pray strength for them. You've got 10 seconds, make it good. Make it good. Strengthen, God. Strengthen. Strength. We pray strength. Bind us in faith. Strengthen us now. for our city and we think of those in our city who've been weakened through the onslaught of mental unwellness perhaps through isolation and fear maybe through abuse or neglect we think of this God we we know that your heart is that none of this would be tolerated in your world. You long for heaven on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what you taught us to pray. And so we pray, Jesus, now, strengthen the bars of your gates, O Nottingham. Be strengthened. People of this city, receive the strength of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, receive your strength. Your Redeemer comes. Father, may you strengthen this city, its inhabitants, its institutions, that it may once more be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Even as the waters cover the sea, we pray for a renewing fire, for a spirit of peace to come upon this city. Even as your church learns to walk in your ways, so may your power be released to your city, that your city might be strengthened. May Nottingham become your place, your house, your city. And may the prayers of your people rise up from this place with faith for a transformation in your city, even in these days. In our city, um, right now, those that are waking up completely and utterly hopeless, in despair, and we pray, Lord, that you would bring hope to every single person right now. Holy Spirit, just a glimmer, a glimpse of hope. And we ask that you would fill this room with the hope of the gospel, with the hope of the end to be with you forever, Jesus. That we get to worship and be with you forever and ever and ever. And we pray that we would go out with that hope, that people would see the hope of your church once more in Jesus' name. Amen. And release, God, a movement of hope through the nations, through the church. Strengthen the church through the nations to release hope into your earth. And we pray this. Let's pray, gather up these prayers together with the kingdom prayer. Let's say it with a little bit of oomph this morning, if you dare. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Bless you this morning. Why don't you take a seat if you haven't already. And we, uh, why don't we take a moment just to welcome each other. Uh, turn to your neighbor, say hi. Ask them where they'll be watching the game this afternoon. What game? The game. I will preach the gospel to myself that I am not a man condemned for Jesus Christ is my defense. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. I'm sorry to cut that short. Look, I know it's your favorite bit. <laughs> but we got excited in the prayer time, didn't we? And so it went on. Welcome to church. Welcome to Trinity Church. If you're new here, or you're visiting as our family are from Australia. Can we welcome the Brisbaneers? Yes. We're going to interview you later. <laughs> a bit of a mediocre welcome there for our Australian brothers and sisters, but we love you. Uh, some of our family are here. Got some folks from the Southwest as well joining us. Welcome. And you may be here from another part of the country or indeed the world. You're very welcome. If you are visiting us, Got some folks from St. Albans. Goodness me. The nations are being gathered uh, to worship God in this place. It's exciting to be together. Our vision as a church is to see the church on fire and the city alive. Uh, we are seeing God do wonderful things in this family. And uh, we're delighted uh, with what he's doing. But we know there's more. And we're pursuing that in a variety of different ways. If you're considering making this place home, you'd be very welcome to join us. If you're not part of a family at this point. Um, and we would just say, as a good starter, you might stick for six. That is your invitation to stay with us uh, for six weeks. If you can string six together in a row, more power to you. Uh, a habit will be built at that point, and you won't be able to escape us, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but we'd love to uh, help you get engaged, not just in sort of attending here, but to become part of the family, and there's loads of ways you can do that. Please do come speak to one of us or do check out our website for more information. Good. We have a few updates this morning. Um, firstly, I just want to update you about the orchard. <laughs> I was waiting for Johnny's whoop. There was no whoop from Johnny. Uh, but, yes, yeah, so the orchard um, is something that my sister and I uh, have, uh, I guess, sort of birthed with Jesus, Jesus' birth, but we've come alongside. Um, but basically, it's a women's conference, and we've done um, this twice already, and we are um, holding another women's event um, in November the 12th, and, uh, and we are really excited about it, and you can buy um, tickets now, uh, they are ready to get through the website. We're actually going to take a coach of Trinity Women, woo! Uh, Goodness so you, me. Yes, yeah, so if you want to jump on the coach, then you can do that as you sign up. Um, but really, simply, we, um, we just feel like God is up to something, honestly. We really feel like he is wanting to raise up and empower women across this nation, across this world, because he wants free women, because he wants free women to come and to serve him for his kingdom purposes. Um, and so we are really excited about everything that he's doing. This isn't just 
a snazzy conference where we join together and have a big hoo-ha, which is fun and we have a great time. But this is liberating women to be everything that God has empowered them to be. So that's what the orchard is and that's why we're really excited about it. So come and join us um, as we see what God wants to do in and through women um, in that way. But also, uh, my sister and I are um, doing a little podcast Um, And we um, did a podcast, I feel like, last year during the lockdown, um, and we are doing it again. Series two has started, (laughs) and uh, and what we are um, discussing and having a bit of a chit-chat about are encounters Jesus has with women um, through the Gospels, and uh, and we have picked nine encounters with different women, and really what we're looking at is what do these encounters say about Jesus What do these encounters say for us and the woman um, in the Bible story? And so we're looking at that, and it actually has been a really, really exciting uh, journey that we've been on. So come and join us. You can sign up for that and listen in. Absolutely. You have to be a woman to go to the conference. You do not have to be a woman to enjoy the podcast. So Are you enjoying it, Tony? Very much so, love. (laughs) Very much. Can't wait for the next installment. When's it out? Okay. It's out. It's out. Thank you. It's out. It's out already. Easter's happening, folks. Uh, Easter, uh, we are coming into Holy Week together. And it's, it's a week of mixed emotions, um, isn't it? As the church journeys to the cross with Jesus, journeying toward Good Friday, and uh, then on through Holy Saturday to Easter Sunday. So we've got all of that journey ahead of us. And we just want to let you know about a couple of services that we're hosting. One of those, Good Friday, in this very place, beginning surprisingly, on, uh, on Friday. It's happening on Friday at 7.30 in this place. So do come along to that. It promises to be, um, I was going to say a lot of fun. I wouldn't say a lot of fun. It will be, it will be powerful, I think. Um, God is going to move in a particular way in that place. And then Easter Sunday will be a huge celebration, and we're going to be meeting at our usual gathering times. We would say we're going we're to be doing baptisms on Easter Sunday. Um, and I, it's a great service, a great gathering to invite friends to. Uh, Some of my friends are coming, looking forward to bringing them uh, along to this. So please do think about who you might invite along to that service in particular. Yes, the other thing about Easter, just really quick, is uh, we have been collecting Easter eggs for our local community. Um, And so we have got a few, we've got a decent amount amount of um, Easter eggs, um, but we still need a few more. So if you are able and you want to um, deliver an egg, an Easter egg, um, here, you can do that either later on this afternoon or tomorrow because we're going to be delivering those out to our local communities with a message of God's love for these children um, who might not on Easter Day get any love at all. Um, and so we're going to do a bit of chocolate and uh, a bit of a message of love to these children across our city. So we would love you to be able to join on that. So bring your eggs and we can do that. All I right. I think that's it. Brilliant. Why don't we take up our offering? Just even as we consider generously giving chocolate uh, to young people. Father, we, we come, even as we prepare our hearts to receive your word, we, we remind ourselves that we are called also to be givers. Father, we, we pray as you are shaping us into generous people. Even as we take up this offering, financial gifts uh, given for the ministry of this church and beyond this church, we pray, Lord, that you would so shape us that we would become ever more generous. I pray, Lord, that this, the story of this church would be one of radical generosity. giving away people, giving away love, compassion, mercy, faith, and also finance. And Lord, I just pray that you would move powerfully among us in this area. Stir us to give ever more generously in Jesus' name and for the sake of your name. Amen. Amen. And have scripture read to us, and I believe Ben is going to come and read. So from Luke 19, 
verse 29. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Colossians 2 verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken away, sorry, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Wonderful. Thanks, Ben. This is Amy, as many of you know. Amy, along with uh, Adam, uh, is, uh, has been part of the church for uh, a whole lot of time. And um, do you from St. Albans, where Ben and Kelly are from? And uh, it's just a joy to have her on team. She's going to preach us this morning. Why don't we pray? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, so much for the story of faith that you're writing in the lives of Amy and Adam and their children. Thank you for the, the passion for truth. Thank you for the friend that they are to so many of us. Thank you for the ministry at the school gate at the front door, in the kitchen, in the church. Thank you for what's to come. A coffee shop and who knows what else. Let your kingdom come in all of it, God. All of it. All of it. And let your kingdom come this morning as she speaks and we welcome your authority through her, God. We welcome you, Jesus, just as you did to ride into this building, just as you did in Jerusalem as king. Be enthroned on the words of this woman. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I'm just going to lift this up. I'm ready. Good morning, everyone. As Johnny said, I'm Amy. I'm married to Adam. He's currently downstairs in Kids Church um, with our four children. And we live in Carrington, just a little bit that way. Now, uh, Henrietta is doing slides for me. The first slide this morning is a picture of Rosa Parks. 
I'm going to start, just a lot of you will know the story of Rosa Parks, but I'm just going to start um, by sharing a little of her story. So on the 1st of December, 1955, Rosa boarded the bus on the way home from work. She did this like she did every other day, and she sat on the front row of the black section of the bus, which was the back half of the bus. And the bus was particularly busy this day, so it started to fill up with people. And a white man got onto the bus and had nowhere to sit. And so the bus driver asked Rosa to stand up. He asked quite a few people to stand up, and some of them did. And Rosa said that uh, on this particular day, in her memoir later in her life, she said, a quiet determination came over her like a quilt on a dark night. And so she said no. And lots of people had been saying no to getting up on these buses. But Rosa, in particular, uh, said no with some vigor. <laughs> and she was arrested and taken away and bailed later that night by white friends and supporters, the Dewar family, who were um, aware of what had been going on in the area. And as she was being bailed, something was happening across the area of Alabama where she lived. People were gathering in churches across the area, and they decided that this was a moment, that Rosa was just the right person that they had been waiting for. And so little, uh, I don't know that Rosa would have known this, as she sat and waited to be released. But the next morning, she woke up for work, and along with her... 40,000 people across that region walked to work. And this is the picture of just some of them walking to work. 40,000 people. So they got themselves organized quickly. <laughs> and they continued to walk to work for over a year. Some of them 20 miles to work. So on day 381, when the bus company just couldn't take it anymore, after dozens and dozens of buses had sat unused for this year, they uh, petitioned to the courts and um, segregated buses in that part of Alabama was deemed unconstitutional. And Rosa, this, this picture is actually a photo opportunity that the journalists came with her, and this is her sat next to a journalist. Rosa boarded a bus sat now next to a white man and traveled to work. And actual, the civil rights movement continued for another decade and lots and lots of other things happened. But in Montgomery, Alabama, the bus boycott led to the first step in removing segregation. In her memoir before her death, at the age of 92, Rosa said this, I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free so other people could be free. Rosa's stand for justice on just that regular day didn't look like an act that would significantly impact the war of injustice raging around her. Assassinations, demonstrations and violence were all around. And yet, in this significant contribution to the war, she simply stayed sat down. A strange victory but one we can see in retrospect, she was a soldier in a war and she won her battle. Today, we're going to explore Jesus's victory on the cross. But like Rosa's, his was a strange victory. We've been in a series looking at the cross. I don't know about you, but it's been hearty, hasn't it? Uh, over the last few weeks. Last week, Mark looked at the topic of substitution the idea that Jesus died in our place. We learned that Jesus doesn't save us from an angry God. Instead, the way Jesus takes our sin from us is to take it in to himself. Our sin becomes his. There is nowhere we can go where God won't pursue us with his love. This week, we are looking at the final description of the cross as we begin Holy Week and finally, next Sunday, celebrate Easter together with baptisms, as Johnny and Amy have said. This week's description is known as Christus Victor. Christ is victorious. The idea that Jesus won a victory on the cross, a victory over sin, 
judgment and death. But before we get into this, let's look at the passage that Ben read to us in Luke. Jesus and his disciples are arriving in Jerusalem. This is the journey that they have been making for so long. And they've finally arrived in the city they've been working their way to. This is a huge moment. As we said, it's the beginning of Holy Week. Jesus knows he is arriving in Jerusalem to die. And he's told his disciples this several times. But still, they see him arriving in Jerusalem to take over. They want to see an army marching on the city and Jesus sat on the throne, overthrowing the government, ruling and reigning in charge. Instead, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a young donkey. Tim Keller describes this entry to the city as almost comical. Imagine in your mind the battle scene of a movie Braveheart or something like that. I feel like that ages me. There's been many, many battle movies since. The victor has weapon in hand, sitting on the back of a huge stallion. There's a vast army behind them shouting, maybe a flag or trumpets. This is the picture the disciples have had in their mind, but it's not the picture they get. Instead, their leader looks like he's riding along a Blackpool beach in August. (laughs) It's pathetic, it's confusing, it's childish, and they don't think it's good enough for Jesus. So they hype it up. They lay their cloaks on the ground. They wave palm leaves. They shout and praise and celebrate and point to Jesus for all they've seen him do. They're confused at this strange entry into this big city. This entrance into Jerusalem does fulfill a prophecy they would have known in Zechariah 9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So there are many mixed moments in this story. This Sunday is often called the triumphant entry or Palm Sunday. It's a happy scene to to begin a difficult week, but it's a complicated scene too. There's a crowd gathered seemingly welcoming Jesus with open arms. They shout Hosanna as he fulfills this ancient prophecy. But we also see a donkey signifying peace. Humility, and Jesus, as Johnny has said, weeping over the city he knows is so lost. He knows the people are looking for a celebrity king and that that isn't who he is. He knows that those who shout Hosanna at him now will soon be shouting to send him to the cross. If the disciples were confused at Jesus on a donkey, their confusion had only just begun. Just as he didn't arrive on the back of a stallion, he didn't end the week boldly sat on a throne. Instead, he hung limp, seemingly defeated, broken and dead on a tree. And yet, he did win. His victory was more than any king sitting on any throne at any time in history. His victory made him the king of kings and the lord of lords. But it's a strange victory, a different kind of winning. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, Jesus is no draftsman of political blueprints. He is the one who vanquished evil through suffering. It looked as though evil had triumphed on the cross but the real victory belonged to Jesus. At times, I find myself questioning, like the disciples did, did he really win? Was the cross really enough? Couldn't he won a different way, a better way? A way that I would find easier to explain to friends and family around me? 
I find myself wanting to add hype to the story, to make Jesus more victorious, more quickly, to make more of a show and something easier to communicate. But to understand what's going on here, I think we have to step back. The disciples so often got caught up in the now, like what was right in front of their nose. They wanted political victory now in their time. But what they and we have to understand is that there is a battle raging greater than we have seen in any newspaper. The forces of darkness are at war with the kingdom of light. We've been learning over these weeks about how dark and slippery and deep and often unseen sin is in our lives, our systems and our nations. This wasn't about one battle in one city. It was about the forces of darkness that run deeper and darker than we often want to recognize. This wasn't about just Jerusalem. It was a once and for all battle of love over evil. Palm Sunday, I think, is such a beautiful picture of what we think we need versus what we really need deeply need. Jesus' whole life and ministry, from being born as a vulnerable baby, to eating with prostitutes, healing lepers, and the way he died, shows us over and over again that he was pushing back the kingdom of darkness with light in a subversive, upside down kind of way. Jesus' character is consistently showing us the face and hands and heart of God. He didn't force the kingdom into being. His character didn't intimidate. He didn't fight. He didn't bully or control. He was consistently gentle, kind, generous, and merciful, And he was powerful. He brings light and the darkness can't hide. He brings healing and sickness can't stay. He brings fullness of life and death withers away. He told us to love our enemies. He turned the other cheek and ultimately he let the people who hated him nail him to a cross, praying for them as they did. The cross was a battle scene, but rather than being killed by darkness, Jesus took the darkness, sin, disappointment, despair, sadness, and shame, and he killed it with him on the cross. This was a battle of two kingdoms, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world. As our Colossians reading that Ben read to us says, he disarmed the powers of darkness and triumphed over them. As he hung there in pain, he was winning the battle for you and for me. Tim Keller explains this Colossians passage really well. He says this, Paul says here in Colossians, Jesus triumphed doubly. On the cross, Jesus destroyed the debt we owe God for our sins. This was the barrier between us and God, and it's been removed. But then, having disarmed the powers, Jesus made a public spectacle of their defeat. This points to the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And, without stealing an Easter Sunday sermon... We know the end of the story, and we know the end of the story is good. I think it's sometimes so hard when we need victory in our lives to look to a man on a donkey, a wounded man hanging on a tree. Sometimes we want to dress him up as Braveheart, as a strong, battle cry kind of leader, violent and dramatic and fast but that isn't who he is. The disciples couldn't make him into someone he wasn't, and neither can we. Our savior is and was and will always be love. 
He died loving us. And he wins the battle for us in love. When I was preparing this, I was asking God what he wanted me to share from my own life. And I think it's this. I promise it relates, so hang in there. Um, Anxiety, for me, has been a big thing in my life since I was little. And anxiety, for me, the best explanation that I've heard of anxiety is that it's like having someone stood behind you tapping on your shoulder. Someone who's pointing out your faults, your fears, and ultimately risks. I've tried to explain anxiety to lots of different people in my life. If you know my husband, Adam, he is the most relaxed man in any room. Even if he caters your wedding one day, he will be the most relaxed man in the room. Um, And I've tried to explain it to him because it's, you know, he's very kind and supportive, but it's very far from his experience of life. And the way I've explained it to him is that it's like this feeling in your stomach that there's something happening tomorrow, like an interview or something, and you're not prepared. So I would find it creeping up on me all different times. The children would be in the park, Adam would be on a climbing frame, I would be sat with my coffee, and I'd have a knot in my stomach, like something was happening later that day, and not really knowing what it was. But it would really, really, all through my life, I remember this feeling of someone saying, there's something you need to be thinking about. But not being able to grasp, what what is it? What do I need to plan? What do I need to prepare? What do I need to fear? Like, it's that kind of feeling. I've tried many times in my own strength to overcome anxiety. Counseling was so incredibly helpful for me. Understanding the stages of a panic attack and knowing when they're coming have helped. But the tapping on my shoulder has always come back around in different ways. Until this one Sunday, a few months ago, here on a Sunday morning, I was stood over there by the double doors, and I really was thick in an anxiety haze. You wouldn't have known it to look at me. I'm sure I was chirpier than normal, if anything. (laughs) But um, inside, I was watching the clock and thinking about a blanket and coffee and TV on a Sunday afternoon. That's what I was sort of heading for. And to be honest, I was bored of that feeling. That's how I would describe it. I was bored of it. And I cried out to God in my head, Lord, where are you in this? Where are you? I've often heard the voice of God being described as a thought you didn't think. And I find that really helpful Because often when I have, like Amy was saying this morning, like the whisper of God, it's so easy to think, oh, was that that me? But so often I think the voice of God is a thought you just know you didn't think for yourself. And on that morning, his voice really was that for me. I cried out, God, where are you in all of this? And his reply was, deep breaths, dear girl. And that was it. It was so small, but so deep in me. I don't have waterproof mascara on, so it could get really messy. I'm sorry. Um, Johnny prayed for weeping, so uh, it might get that way. The voice of my father was reminding me that the battle for me, for my heart, for my mind, for my life, for everything I could fear in my future was one by him, all by him, and all I had to do was breathe it in, breathe in his grace, breathe in his approval over me, breathe in his victory. I really do believe that on that morning, I found freedom from anxiety. As Amy says, we're onions, right? There's layers, there's layers, there's layers. And there might be more, and I'm so ready, if there is more, to go to God with that more. But in that moment, something changed for me. And in moments where I feel a knot in my stomach rising, I have a new strategy. And it seems silly. And when I was preparing this, it seems a bit like a man on a donkey. But it really has changed my life. When I feel that knot in my stomach forming, I simply whisper to myself, my children have actually caught me doing it, um, I am a daughter of the king. And I breathe. I've done it 
in supermarkets. I mean, Asda is the place, isn't it? I've done it in supermarkets. I've done it making dinner. I've done it in bed. I've done it in the shower. I've done it reading stories. All over my house, my life, I whispered that to myself. I am a daughter of the king. I cannot save myself. You can't save yourself. We can't win our own wars. I can't rescue myself from my worries. I can't keep my family safe. But I am safe. Jesus took fear and anxiety and panic and shame with him on the cross. And it died with him. And because of Jesus, I can claim my place as his daughter. There is a place prepared for me at his table forever. John Wimber calls this being a citizen of two kingdoms. We are citizens of this earth and yet always citizens of heaven. My future and yours is safe and secure. Preaching the victory of Jesus is not preaching a message of everything in your life will be shiny because of him. That would be simple and would have taken a lot less time to prepare. <laughs> but Jesus didn't march into the city, take the throne, make his disciples generals and give them, I don't know, high-heeled wives and shiny houses. That isn't our savior. That's not who he is. The scriptures tell us victory means our security. In John 16, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart I have overcome the world. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this, Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Dane Ortland, in his beautiful book, Gentle and Lowly, says this, the felt love of Christ really is what brings rest, wholeness, flourishing, shalom. In these moments, you see that in Christ, you truly are invincible. The verdict really is in. Nothing can touch you. He has made you his own and will never cast you out. Jesus's victory on the cross doesn't guarantee us a shiny life, but it does guarantee us a life safe in the knowledge that we belong to him. And that brings freedom. John tells us that we have been given the right through Jesus to be children of God. His spirit lives in us and the forces of darkness that damage us and tap on our shoulders, cannot win us over. The battle between love and evil has been fought and won. Love wins and continues to win. Dallas Willard says this, only when those who really do know that Jesus is the light of the world, take their stand with him and fulfill their calling from him to be children of light, will there be any realistic hope of stemming the tide of evil and showing the way out of that tide to those who really want out? Jesus doesn't need us to make him more of a king. He doesn't need us to dress him up, put him on a horse, dry his tears and give him a weapon. His victory, strange and upside down as it was, was enough. He won once and for all. The powers of darkness will be over and over and over again, overcome by the children of light. Our response is to live in the victory, the safety, the security, and the childlike faith that says, I belong to the King. Where this morning do you need to?
to shine the light of Jesus into your life? Where are you trying to win your own war? Where do you need to take some deep breaths and let him be the king? Like Rosa, we win by sitting down. Come, take heart, sit at the feet of Jesus and let him win you in love. Amen. Why don't we stand together? We're going to pray. Lord, in this moment, we trust you. We trust that you're working. We trust that you are loving us. Thank you that you are king in this room right now. Yeah, I pray for people this morning here who, maybe it's you, maybe it's just me, who just need to be reminded that we are children, we are children of God. That is too hard to be in charge of ourselves. That we need you, Jesus, and you long to love us, to father us. Come and meet with your children this morning, Lord. Place crowns on their heads. Remind us who we are, Jesus. The Lord is here and we're just going to honour his, his presence in a particular way and in a second we'll respond in, in worship, the band will lead us but I was particularly impacted by this, this phrase from, that Amy shared from Dane Ortland, the felt love of Christ. She said that, I was reminded that Jesus in this story, Amy is so exquisitely brought alive to us he he heals and does all those things with his presence by being in there and among it and bringing victory in this strange way and I, I just wonder if there's just a moment here um, for some folks in particular to respond yeah. and to experience his felt love mm. maybe through a whisper in your heart, in your mind, through a, a, a sense of his presence, but a, you know something that you can experience and take to the bank. We make no apology whatsoever here for the claim that God actually wants to reveal himself in a way we can understand. I don't have time now. I could take you through the whole Bible and tell you why. That was always his expectation and has been his habit throughout history. But even now, I just want to encourage you, if you need to respond today and there is an area of your life where you are longing for him to take up residence and to bring about his strange victory, I'd invite you forward and we'd love to pray with you. Just come now. Thank you. 
Thank you for the victory, Jesus. As people walk forward, let them breathe it in. Thank you that you are liberating the captives today. You are applying the victory you won to us in a fresh way today. Yeah, and we receive this by faith, right? Faith, as Wimber said, is the currency of the kingdom. And, and the faith, what faith looks like today, sometimes faith looks like singing in a, a, in a shopping, I can't want to say store, that's American, a shopping shop, <laughs> a shop, <laughs> at least one of those words is redundant, sometimes it looks like walking to the front of a church, but I, I, I cannot, I cannot in integrity, remove the need for faith in this. So if you want to see a, a, a movement of something in your life, there is a bit for you to do, and it is to walk forward and respond. Strengthen your f- feeble hands. Make firm your weak knees. Lord Jesus, as folks um, respond, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And I pray particularly for uh, that, that Amy's story, and I, I, I name this enemy, this darkness of anxiety. We don't ask how it came about, Lord. We, we don't care. But we know that you're Lord over it. We know that your victory on the cross uh, makes possible the victory over this foe. And we declare it to be a foe. We're not going to shake hands with it. We're going to make friends with it. Uh, we're not going to domesticate it. Welcome it into our house and give it a name. Lord, we want to see freedom. And we don't shame anyone who experiences it either. But we do pray, Lord, by your blood, claim the victory over it. In your power, in your strength. We do not believe self-help works. We renounce that false gospel. But we do believe the blood of Jesus is enough. And we pray the same over depression. And we ask actually today, Lord, as well, uh, for physical healing too. And if there's something that you would like to receive prayer for in that area, please come forward also. We'd love to pray with you. We do not believe in, uh, as Amy said, hype or triumphalism, but we do believe the cross is a triumph. It is a victory. So we're going to worship, but I just welcome you to come. Come to this place at the front. We pray with you. And um, we'll I just sense too, there might be one um, person maybe, when I was talking about a knot in my stomach, I just sense that maybe there might be someone who, for them it's more like this sort of tangle of wool, that they're like, oh, what knot would I start with? <laughs> you know, where would I begin? And um, I just saw the hands of Jesus just begin to unpick, just really gently. And I just wonder if there's someone that feels like it's too jumbled, too complicated, too messy. And um, I would just encourage you to come and seek prayer and know that Jesus is so gentle and he's not looking for this kind of one five minute moment. He's with you for the long haul to untangle to undo each knot in their own time. And as 
as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. I fight on my knees with my hands lifted. 
lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I'll sink through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Continue to pray for folks for as long as we need to. So if you haven't received prayer and you'd like to, I encourage you to come forward. But uh, close our service officially now with a blessing. I encourage you, if you brought children, make sure you don't leave without them. They should still be downstairs. Why don't we hold our hands out in readiness to receive a final blessing. Reading from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May you go, church, in the knowledge of his victory. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be upon you today. Remain with you this week and always. Amen. Amen. Church, go in peace. Be blessed this week. Amen.